Hi everybody, it's great to be back here again. Aitaman is Friday. Today is Rosh Chodesh Menachim Av. It is the memorial day of Aaron the High Priest, who is buried in the village. His children are buried in the village right below here on Itama. As we all know, people like going and traveling in different parts of Israel, different portions of the week that represent, that are symbolic to that, to that particular portion. And here in Itama, we have a place that is symbolic to so many portions. Just last week, Pinchas, we read about Pinchas, and he's also buried in the village below over here. The 70 elders are buried of Joshua. And of course, we're surrounded by the tomb of Joseph and all the great holy places of um, Israel, these great our forefathers, amazing, amazing places um, that surround our community. And I all recommend that you come here and visit and enjoy these very, very historical, Torah, biblical um, places that we have here around our community. Um, we know today we begin the march towards the 9th of Av, we're beginning the nine days, a very, very difficult time for the Jewish people as we mourn over our temple. I want to open it with a story. It just goes back a couple of years ago. I happened to be in, in um, New York for Tisha B'Av. And I felt, I went to Shul. I remember going with my father into a Shul, into a synagogue. And, and we were saying, of course, Lamentations, ki, um, the keynote, the different memorial um, um, portions that we say. And honestly, when I sat down, I, I, someone sat down next to me and I was listening to them. They were talking about the ball game, and they're talking about the, the Yankee scores and the Mets scores, whatever it was, and different things. And I was saying to myself, "What's going on over here? Here we are. It's been a couple of thousand years. Our temple's not being rebuilt, and people are more interested in the ball game than really what's going on. Of course, the difficult language of these lamentations, and um, it makes it harder, of course, to understand. And therefore, they just couldn't understand probably what they're reading. But I think it's much more than that. The whole situation." of the last 2,000 years, we've been, our senses have been so, um, as we say in Hebrew, become mechuspasim. Like, so you can't even feel them anymore. We've become numb. And we forget what really the Temple means to us and what all these special, what prophecy means to, to the nation of Israel. And these things are so, become so far away from our hearts and therefore people who can't really, they don't really pray anymore with, with all the hearts and all the souls. Well, in order to understand and, and try to rectify this, I want to bring down a, a verse in this week's portion. If you read um, chapter, it's a double portion, so I have a lot of verses here. But if we bring down it in chapter 35, and of course we're completing the book of Bamidbar, of Numbers this week as well. If we, re, if we bring back um, verse number 28, 35, 28, the Torah tells us, Ki be'ir A very simple thing. The Torah teaches us that when the person who committed a um, crime of killing someone through negligence. He has to go to a city of refuge, or a six city of refuge. There are six cities like that. Uh, this three in this part of the Jordan, three in the other part of the Jordan. And a person who committed an act of, of, of negligence, again, that caused someone to die, he has to be punished <clears throat> by going to a city of refuge. But we know it's the, his punishment depends upon the death of the high priest, which is very strange. It's not really um, symmetrical because for one person that could kill someone um, accidentally, let's say someone got in a car and accidentally ran over someone, God forbid, another person was working with a with a heavy um, truck and the truck fell on someone, whatever, a part of the truck fell. There are different scenarios of killing someone accidentally, God forbid, causing someone through negligence to be killed, but not, and they'll never get the same punishment because the Kohen Gadol could, if he dies in 60 years from now, the person has to stay 60 years in the city of refuge. And if the Kohen God never dies, and he dies, he, and this guy dies first, he's buried in the city of refuge, and only after the Kohen God dies, they can take his body out and bury it in his own plot of his family somewhere else. And of course, a person may not have to go at all to the city of refuge, because if the Kohen God dies, as he's being transferred there, he's free. It doesn't seem to be um, fair. But of course, we know God knows deep down what everyone, every particular person has committed, and there are different levels of negligence. We know some people, um, you know, don't care about taking care of their cars. They drive with they drive with their brakes half gone, or with the wheel not in place, with the wheels not tightened on, or with their with their steering wheel not in line properly. And God forbid, they can cause uh, through negligence to kill people. Or those who actually, as we talk, we have someone driving a motorcycle out there. How much danger is caused by motorcycles? Um, on the other hand, people drink and get drunk when they drive. So there's definitely a lot of negligence involved. And these situations would bring a person to the city of refuge, but there are different levels. Let's say golf is a terrible story. It took place over nearby Itamar um, a couple of years ago, where a child on a rainy day ran under the, under the, under a bus, and was was killed unfortunately. 
And that, of course, was an accident, such an accident that was done by his uncle, who was a bus driver, a terrible tragedy. Um, it happened again this time of year. No, it didn't happen now. It happened, it was a rain day, if I recall, in the winter. I'm sorry, I thought it happened in Av, as we know, a difficult time period. But no, this happened um, in the winter time. But this terrible tragedy was such an accident that we can't even consider it almost, nay, it wasn't negligence at all. It could have happened to anybody. But the fact that God brought it through him says something as well. And therefore, only God knows the way he cal makes calculations and the way he decides how much punishment to meet out for each person. And therefore, the different um, situations where one person may stay there for 60 years, one person may stay less, it all depends upon um, cal the divine calculations which are way beyond us. But that's one explanation doesn't answer all the questions. And it's a difficult thing to understand. Another thing as well, we know what would the people do that were sentenced to this city of refuge? What would they do? They'll be praying very, very hard that the the high priest dies because they want to get out of there. No one wants to stay in the city of refuge forever. And that's and therefore the Talmud in, in the tractate of Makot tells us the mothers of the high priest would actually bring garments and bring food to the um, those sentenced to the city of refuge. So therefore they wouldn't pray for their sons to die. And that's in itself is a very big question. So now they brought them food and they brought them clothes, but they'll still pray for the son to die because they want to get out of there. So in order to understand this and to, to wrap it up to tie everything together, what I opened up with, like to bring um, a story which talks about the, pow the power of tefillah. There are so many stories, we're not going to have time today just to bring down so many stories throughout the Talmud and throughout everywhere about how much, we, how much of a difference we can make if we pray the right way. We should never give up. Never, never give up. There's a story which, when I heard the story the first time and I read it, I cried. And it, it brings tears to, my, tears to my eyes every time I read the story again. It's about a son, a, a five-year-old boy. His father was on his deathbed. And two great rabbis, Rabbi, so this is brought down in the Zohar Kadosh, the Holy Zohar and Pashat Balak. And the two great rabbis, Rabbi, Rabbi Lazar and Rabbi Acha, I think, Rabbi Chia, they came and they said, let's go take care of this Rabbi Yossi Mipiki'in, that was his name. Let's take care of him because he's, you know, he's going to die. Let's, let's, we have to take care of his funeral arrangements. And they just saw that he was on the way out completely. So they came together with the other great rabbis, and they went to the house, and they saw that the boy, the five-year-old boy, did not let anyone, or well, this little boy did not let anyone get approach the father's um, deathbed. And the boy's mouth was on the father's mouth, and he was crying and screaming and praying to Hashem to bring life to his father. And he was saying, Hashem, didn't you teach us in the Torah when there's a, there's a story of a concipo of a mother bird with its eggs and you have to send the mother off before you take the eggs? So how here it's the opposite. My, me and my sisters are um, here, my mother, me and my sister are here, my father's on this deathbed. Take us, take the eggs, but let my father live. And if you say this, the Torah talks about a mother over the eggs, not a father, well, my mother, you already took my mother, she died, we're orphans. And my father now is our mother and our father. So don't do this. Let our father live. Let him live. And the child is crying and breathing into his father's mouth. And everyone's surrounding. And when the rabbis heard the boy screaming and crying, they all began to break out and cry completely. And an amazing miracle happened. There's an amazing story that the father was granted 22 more years of life. He came back to life and in order to teach his, his little son Torah. And that's what his son, the whole prayer, but his, his little son was saying, he screamed to his father saying, oh, who's going to teach me Torah? No one's going to teach me Torah. And his father was sent back 22 more years to teach his son to study, to study Torah. He received an amazing power of tefillah on the head of the father. He was dead, but he brought him back to life. A real res resurrection. Brought him back to life. So it's not just when we talk about the dead being revived one day. It's going to happen. It's not just the make up stories we see here in the Zohar, all these Zohar Kadosh. This teaches us again what the power of tefillah is all about. We're all familiar with the famous story of, of Isaiah and Chizkiyahu Melech, when the, um, Isaiah said to Chizkiyahu, there's no chance anymore, since he, no chance for you, you're going to be, I already see that you're going to die. And Chizkiyahu says, get out over here, leave my home, even if a sword is placed on a person's neck, he should never prevent himself from, from praying to Hashem, because things can be changed around. And these two stories, and there are many more, bring us back to, to the question I asked um, beforehand. How could the mother who's giving gifts to the high priest 
I mean, giving gifts to the those who are in the city of refuge to prevent the of the son who's the high priest from being to be that they prevent them from praying that he should die, God forbid. How could it work? We see how powerful tefillah could be. It could resurrect the dead. It could turn around decrees and completely turn things around. So what's going to be my mother giving them, appeasing them with these, with these, again, with gifts, with food and gifts? And the answer is, tefillah shall emet, a true tefillah. And that's the, that brings everything back together. Where I spoke about in the beginning before, when I was in America and I saw the people that were, that were praying on, on the um, Tisha B'Av. And uh, that's one example. It can happen anywhere. It can happen in Israel as well. Because we've so forgotten we've, our true hearts are so closed and we're so involved in our mundane, materialistic um, selves, our lives, that we forget that we shut ourselves off and become so um, insensitive to what the most important things in this world are, are mean and what they're all about. If we open our hearts and start to pray to Hashem with all our hearts and all our soul, we can actually bring, we can revive the dead. We can turn things around. We can bring miracles about. And of course we can restore our temple. And we know so well right now that here the temple sits here in ruins on, in Israel and Jerusalem. And the world, of course, is blind and oblivious to what the, what true, the true owners of, of that mountain is all about. That's going to change, of course. But if we really pray with all our hearts and our soul. We can turn things around. But, of course, I want to add in a very important fact, a factor to this whole thing. A prayer can only help after we've done everything in our power first. And we have so many things to do in our power to turn things around. Once we've done all that we can do in our human capacity, prayer takes the place. But we can't pray, we're really not, we can't really pray and say, this is a true prayer coming from your heart, if we're really just like, like a bird saying, bop, 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 what is it all worth if you can really do something about it? And this comes to place so many situations. It's not a, tr a prayer really comes from your heart. This boy, uh, the, the tears of a little five-year-old child, was able to revive the death of his father. Because that was a prayer that came from his heart and every bit of his heart and soul. King Cheskiyahu Melech was able to revert the decree because he prayed to Hashem with, those, with all his heart and soul. And if we see um, people sometimes have given up, this is my son that comes back home today from the army. Terrible story this week. One of his partners in this, again, in this elite unit, Israeli army, had a headache, wasn't feeling well. They took him to the doctor. Before you know it, he's, in his, he's on his deathbed now. And my son now went to visit his friend in the hospital to see how he's doing, but it doesn't look good. But I told my son, Ephraim, listen, don't give up because a prayer could turn things around. The worst situations, in the situation of people who are sick, terminally ill, we have to pray to Hashem, open our hearts, and, and realize that we can have an effect and we can make a change and make a difference. In fact, we, we know friends that are not feeling well. If we have anyone, we hear about someone not feeling well, we can pray, or ourselves go off and not feeling well, we, of course, must always use the power of prayer to believe that we can do and make a change, difference by praying with all our heart and soul. And the fact that we're seeing our temple in ruins and we're not doing anything about it, it's a disgrace. Hashem wants to hear our prayers and really mean it. Meaning it means coming to Israel, coming to build, trying to do what we can to build a temple. That's what it really means, that we really care about. It really is a loss. But some people say, okay, let's wait another hundred years, another thousand years before the temple's rebuilt. We have to do what we can to, to establish the kingdom in Israel and build the land of Israel, and establish the land of Israel, and educate the people of Israel, so we can make these changes really really take place. And that is a tefillah. But when the mother, they would give gifts, again, to the, um, those who were sentenced to the city of refuge, in order to, the, now it won't be a pr prayer for their hearts anymore. Why? Because now they were bribed, so, okay, now they really can't give a, a, a prayer with all their hearts and soul. And therefore, that was the whole tactic the mother used in order to prevent them from praying for their son, the Kohen, the high priest would die, of course. But this all brings it connects with the temple itself, and that should really be our prayer for us as we begin the nine days. Let us pray with our hearts and soul, and everyone has the power. Different people can do, do different things. Do what you can to bring about and restore again 
the Beit Midash. Let's pray with all our hearts and soul and believe that we have a power to make a difference. Shabbat Shalom.